Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we are going to look at chapter 14 in the principles of microeconomics, looking at labor markets and income. And labor markets work just like other markets we've talked about with market forces of supply and demand. What's different here is we're talking about the quantity of labor, whether it's the number of workers hired, the number of hours of labor we need to have for our firm, um, or how many workers per day, workers per week, some measure of the quantity of labor. And then the cost and the price of labor is going to be in dollars. And so we're going to be talking about an equilibrium wage when we look at the demand for labor and the supply of labor. This is a pretty long chapter, so we're going to go through it um, quickly. I'm going to break some parts out, so I will do an example of how to determine wages and labor demand by looking at the value marginal product of labor in a separate video, just so this one doesn't get too long. Um, and hopefully that helps support your understanding of it. The key terms here we want to think about in alphabetical order are going to be affirmative action, bilateral monopoly, collective bargaining, because we will be talking about unions and market power. Uh, we'll also be talking about discrimination in terms of income and labor market disparities and how we might see discrimination play out in labor markets. Uh, we'll talk about what's called the first rule of labor markets, which is basically that an employer is never going to pay a worker more than they are worth in terms of their productivity. Um, also monopsony, which is a new fun word, but it's actually not that complicated of, of a concept. It's basically instead of being a monopoly seller, a monopsony is a monopoly buyer. So we'll talk about what that means. And then uh, the last term is what we call perfectly competitive labor market, which is just the idea that a labor market is functioning in the way we expect it to. So grab your textbook, grab your slides, and grab your notes, and let's get going. Okay? Great. Okay. <clears throat> so let's get started with our slides. And we first want to start thinking about this. We want to start thinking about the determinants of income. And this is something we're all concerned with, right? Um, and so we're going to be talking about what determines income in labor markets, uh, the theory of labor markets, sort of how economics and economists think of labor markets. We're going to talk about wages and employment in an imperfectly competitive market. So taking our ideal in the first section and then relaxing our assumptions in the second section. And then we'll talk about another version of an imperfectly competitor labor, competitive labor market, uh, looking at unions and market power on the supply side. And then we'll talk about what's called a bilateral monopoly in labor markets. Uh, you'll get a little bit better sense of that. And then in the end, we'll talk about employment discrimination, which is where we see uh, labor market disparities in terms of um, income and other labor market outcomes based on race, gender, sex, and other dimensions. And then we'll wrap it up with a quick discussion of immigration and how immigration affects labor markets. And this is relevant for all of us because we all care about our income, right? Um, income is a really big determinant of our quality of life and what we're able to do in our lifetime, in our future, what kinds of things we have access to for our family. Um, in the U.S., income is based pretty much on how much your employer or a given employer values you. And that tends to depend on education, at least in part. Um, one of the reasons that a lot of people get an education is because of the expectation that it's going to make them more productive um, and therefore earn them higher wages. And we talked about this a little bit in the last chapter where we talked about positive externalities and public goods because education can be considered something that has private benefit to the person getting an education, but also public benefit to society. Um, but uh, college is expensive, and so we want to talk about sort of these trade-offs of what determines wages, what can influence and increase wages, and what can decrease wages, and just get a better sense of how the labor market works, how it's like a traditional market, and how it's different from a traditional market for, say, shoes or pizza. Um, and so as we get into it, we're going to talk about the theory of labor markets, we're going to talk about wages, determ determinants of wages, and we'll look at imperfectly competitive labor markets, unions, monopsonies, bilateral monopolies, discrimination, and immigration. So in this first section, looking at the theory of labor markets, we're going to talk about demand and 
uh, labor markets, both in a perfectly competitive and an imperfectly competitive situation. And the first thing we want to think about is this first rule of labor markets. The first rule of labor markets says that if a firm wants to maximize profits, it will never pay more for a worker than the value of their marginal productivity for the firm. And so whether we're talking about wages or a wage and benefits package, um, firms who are maximizing profits, and we assume all firms do, are not going to pay you more than you're worth as an employee. And so the way we want to think about labor demand from the perspective of the employer is going to be based on the value of the worker. And this is a little bit of, I think this is one of the hardest concepts in this chapter. And so if you keep an eye out, I'm going to put together a video that goes through a mathematical example of how to solve this and really outlines what value marginal product of labor is. <clears throat> so if you're having a hard time understanding this, reach out and um, check out for that video. Or you can always go to my YouTube channel and I'll link it below where you can go and check out my other videos on value marginal product of labor. But the big idea here is that demand of lab for labor is based on the value of what you can produce. So if I work at a pizza company and in a given hour I can produce 10 pizzas that can be sold for $12 each, then my hourly value to the company is $120, right? 10 pizza or 12 pizzas, $10 each. That's $120 of value I've produced on the margin as a single worker. And so what we're going to look at in terms of demand for labor is going to be this idea of the value of the marginal productivity of labor or the value marginal product of labor. And you'll see this abbreviated a lot as VMPL, value marginal product of labor, but really try to de-escalate this term because what we're talking about is just what you can produce and how much it's worth because we want to turn a worker's productivity into dollars so that we can later on compare it to wages. And we always in economics want to start with our ideal market. We did that when we talked about labor market structure and we're going to do that here too. We're going to start out by talking about a perfectly competitive labor market. And a perfectly competitive labor market is a labor market where firms can hire all the labor they want at the going market wage. And so it's going to have lots of firms hiring labor, lots of workers supplying their labor to the market, and that's going to give us a good strong equilibrium. We're going to have lots of competition, we're going to have low information costs, lots of clarity, um, and that's going to be a good perfectly competitive labor market. Does that make sense? And um, if you're already stumbling on the value marginal product of labor idea, there is an example of it in the textbook. But the two big ideas of value marginal product of labor are that it's, you know, the value of your marginal productivity and that it's going to be declining. Because if we think about adding one more worker to a situation where everything else is fixed, each additional worker is going to be a little bit less productive than the previous worker. And so you can see an example of it here where if we assume fixed capital, then the marginal product of labor is going to decline as we hire more workers. And if this seems weird, think about a food truck. And I probably used this example before because I think it's a really good example. But if you have a food truck with zero workers, then labor equal to zero, your marginal product is zero. There's no value. But that first worker you put in your food truck is going to have a ton of additional marginal product. They're going to be able to, say, produce four sandwiches, um, help really get your company going. The second worker is also going to increase your productivity, but it's not going to be as big a bang for your buck, not as much productivity on the margin as the previous person. So maybe they only produce an additional three units of productivity. The third worker is going to also be more productive, but now that's why I like the food truck example. The truck is getting crowded. Um, there might be some issues where they're bumping into each other. That fixed capital is going to start to bump up against the increasing labor to the point where even the fourth worker is increasing the marginal product by a little bit but by less. And a fifth worker wouldn't increase productivity at all. It would start to give us a flat productivity or zero marginal product. Um, so hopefully that kind of helps give you a sense of, of this idea that in the short run, when capital is fixed, 
the marginal productivity, the marginal product, how much each additional worker can make and do is going to decline as we add more and more labor to the same number of equipment, the same number of food trucks, the same number of desks and computers, that kind of thing. So if I have like one office space with two desks and two computers, the first worker, very productive. Second worker, pretty productive. Third worker, okay, yeah, maybe a little bit. We can have coverage and things like that. Fourth worker, fifth worker, sixth worker, less and less productive on the margin. And that's what we economists like to talk about. So as we increase labor, we're going to see the marginal product of labor decline. And then we just multiply that marginal product of labor by price, the price of the output, to get the value of the marginal product of labor. And that's going to be really important for us in terms of deriving labor demand curves. Because what we're going to see is, in a perfectly labor, competitive labor market, firms are going to hire labor up until the point where the value marginal product of labor is equal to wages. And think about it this way. If my value marginal product of labor is $120 at the pizza place, and the next person is worth maybe um, $100. They can produce 10 pizzas, uh, 10 more pizzas for $10 each. The third person can produce eight pizzas at $10 each, so that's $80. As the value marginal product of labor falls, it's going to decrease the probability of hiring the next person. And when are you going to stop hiring people? You'll stop hiring when wages are greater than value marginal product. So if value marginal product of labor is going down, when wage is equal to value marginal product of labor, that's when we stop hiring each marginal worker. And so what we're going to see is the value marginal product of labor curve is equal to the labor demand curve. And our equilibrium quantity of labor in a competitive labor market is going to be where the market wage is equal to the value marginal product of labor. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, if the employer does not sell its output in a perfectly competitive market, um, if they face a downward sloping demand curve for their output, then it means it's going to alter their demand for workers in a subtle way. What we'll see if they aren't in a com perfectly competitive output market is that their demand for labor is going to be based on marginal product times marginal revenue. And that's just because now prices aren't staying the same at every level of production. So in a imperfectly competitive labor market or in an imperfectly competitive output market, firms are going to take the marginal product of labor and then instead of multiplying it by price, multiply it by the marginal revenue curve. And that will give us our marginal revenue product of labor. And if that doesn't make any sense, look at it this way. So here we have the value marginal product of labor, but now we're multiplying it by the marginal revenue product of labor. And that gives us this new labor demand curve that's going to be steeper and further in because now instead of being in a perfectly competitive output market, our firm is in a more monopolistic, um, less competitive output market. And so they're going to see their marginal revenue fall as they produce more. It's going to make them produce less, which means they're going to need less labor. And this gets back to what we talked about with the difference between monopolies and perfectly competitive firms. Monopolies are going to tend to produce less in terms of output than a perfectly competitive firm will. And so we're going to see a monopoly need less labor to produce less output than a perfectly competitive firm in a perfectly competitive interest industry would. So where do our wages come from then? Our market wage rate is going to be in determined by that demand for labor, whether it's competitive perfectly or not, and the supply of labor. And the supply of labor is going to come from a couple of things. It's going to come from our size of our population, how many workers there are, and then it's going to come from the um, attitudes we have about labor and wages and leisure. And so this is the idea that 
as wages go up, you're going to be more and more willing to give up your leisure time. So think about if a friend asked you to come and work for them on a Saturday afternoon. If they offered you $10 an hour, you'd probably say, you know what, my Saturdays are worth more than that to me. But if they offered you $20 or $30 or $40, now you're starting to think maybe you would go and work on a Saturday. And the higher the wage, the more willing you and other workers are going to be to supply their labor to the market. And so we're going to see an upward sloping labor supply curve and a downward sloping labor demand curve. And if you want to get some great real data on um, labor markets, wages, employment rates, numbers of workers in different fields and different industry sectors, uh, the FRED database, which is the Federal Reserve of St. Louis, collects data on all of this stuff. Um, for several months over states at the national level, and you can check it all out by clicking on the link right here. And if we have some time, maybe we can take a look at that. So that's where we're going to see equilibrium wages come from. In a competitive labor market, equilibrium wage and the equilibrium quantity of labor is going to come from the market supply of labor, which is workers willing to supply their labor to the market at a given wage, and the demand for labor which comes from either that value marginal product of labor curve or the marginal revenue times the marginal product of labor curve. Um, but either way, we're going to see, just like in a normal traditional market, we're going to see equilibrium come from that point where market demand is equal to market supply. And so here we have our downward sloping market demand for labor and our upward sloping market supply and our equilibrium wage and quantity of labor is given by that intersection. Over here at higher rates of labor, more people want to work for higher wages, but firms don't want to hire them. Over here at lower levels of labor, there are more firms willing to hire and pay workers more and lots of workers willing to work for even lower wages. And so we'll keep seeing workers get hired up until we get to this point when we're at equilibrium, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. So if you want to look up these kinds of ideas in the um, Fred labor market data, you can take a look at that and that'll give you a sense of it. Now that we have a sense for how perfectly competitive labor markets work, we want to talk about imperfectly competitive labor markets. And this is going to get at the idea first of a demand side level of market power. And basically, imperfect competition can come from two places. It can come from the demand side, where employers have a lot of power. And it can come from the supply side, where employees, the workers, have a lot of power. And the first thing we're going to look at is the demand side. And that's where we get to use our fun new economics term, monopsony. A monopsony is a sole buyer of something. And when we talk about monopsony, we're usually talking about a sole employer. I am the only one hiring labor in the area, and so I don't face direct competition. In exactly the way that a monopolist doesn't face competition in selling, a monopsonist in a monopsony doesn't face competition in hiring. So think about it. If I'm the only one hiring workers in this labor market, I get to set wages. And you don't have anywhere else you can work. So I can set wages lower than I would in a more competitive market where you could go and decide to work for someone else. So this gets us to another new concept, the idea of the marginal cost of labor. That's going to be the cost to a firm of hiring a worker. And this comes from the idea that hiring workers does come at a cost. Um, it's the cost associated with training, hiring, those kinds of things. And so that's going to have an effect in a monopsony market on the demand for workers. Okay? And um, if you're looking through the book, you'll notice we skipped a whole section here. And this section just looks at labor market protections. Um, and these are different laws that set minimum hourly wages, outlaw child labor, um, put in place regulations for health and safety, civil rights guarantees for anti-discrimination, um, immigration reform, and um, 
benefits for workers in terms of unemployment insurance, disabilities, etc. And so that's really just interesting to give you a sense of how the labor market has evolved in terms of regulation over the last 100 years or so. Um, so now let's talk more about these imperfectly competitive markets because the idea here is that in a perfectly competitive market, firms and workers have the same amount of power. But if you feel like firms have more power in a hiring situation, then maybe we're in the space where there might be some monopsony power. In our example, we're going to assume it's like a company town. There's nowhere else to work for miles. Maybe it's a factory town or something like that, and you don't have a lot of options. And so in a monopsony, since the market is or the the firm is the sole demander of labor they're going to face the entire market supply curve because they don't have to compete with anyone else and so they're going to have to alter wages in order to encourage the next worker because they see all workers in that supply of labor and so what we're going to see is in addition to that labor um, supply curve we're going to see an upward sloping marginal cost of hiring additional labor. And it's going to be higher than the traditional labor supply curve um, because there's no one else competing. And this is sort of the other side of the coin from what we saw with a monopoly, where monopolies face a downward sloping demand curve. And so they face that downward sloping marginal revenue curve. Same thing here. If there's a supply curve that represents the cost of hiring a worker in a competitive market, no one firm sees that individual supply curve. Um, so let me look at it. Let me show it to you this way. If we have a market for labor where we have the quantity of labor here and wages up here, in a traditional market, there are lots and lots of firms, and then there is some market supply of labor where there's all these different workers along the supply curve who are willing and able to work at higher wages. Some people will work for very low wages, some people will work for moderate wages, and some people will only work for very high wages. If on the other hand, instead of having lots and lots of firms, there's only one firm hiring, then they don't see, they, they see this. They don't um, just accept the market wage and the market quantity of labor. They actually see a marginal cost of labor in the same way that a monopolist sees the marginal revenue from selling a good. And so what's that, what is that going to mean? It's going to mean that when they're determining their demand for workers, when they're looking at the value marginal product of labor or the demand for labor in a market, they're not going to base it on where demand equals supply. Instead, they're going to say, hey, I only have to hire at the marginal cost equal to value marginal product of labor, and I only have to pay based on the minimum wage that this marginal worker is willing to accept. And so what we're going to see is, instead of this being the equilibrium in a competitive labor market, we're going to see a, monop a monopsonist or a monopsony have this level of labor and this wage in a monopsony. Does that make sense? So monopsonies will hire workers up to the point where the marginal cost of labor is equal to the value marginal product of labor and then pay them the lowest possible wage to cover the costs of hiring those workers. And so what we're going to see in a monopsony market is Fewer workers hired, if we compare it to a sort of uh, competitive equilibrium, right? If this was, say, the, um, the labor market in a competitive equilibrium and the wage in a competitive equilibrium, we're going to see wages be lower 
and the quantity of labor hired be lower. And that's what we're going to expect in a labor market under a monopsony, under imperfect competitive markets. So rather than paying workers based on the value marginal product of labor and the labor supply, they're going to base it on the value marginal product of labor or the demand for labor and that marginal cost curve and then pay them the lowest possible wage. And so that's basically them exploiting their market power, doing what firms do, maximizing profit by minimizing costs. Okay? Does that make sense? Hopefully, a little bit? Hopefully. Okay. What about the other side? It can't all be bad. It can't all just be firms having all the power. And it's not. There's also an example of market power on the supply side of labor. And this is what a labor union is. Uh, there's other examples, but labor unions are the most common. And a labor union is just an organization of workers that negotiates collectively with employers over wages and working conditions. So rather than just you going up to your boss and say, hey, I've been working hard, pay me more. It's you and everyone else in your union going up and saying, we all demand these changes. And if we don't get it, we would all leave or we would all strike or something like that. And so the whole point of a labor union is to try and change the balance of power. It sort of assumes that employers have more power in a labor market than workers do. And so by collectively bargaining, they increase the power of the individuals because now we have uh, a whole group of workers bargaining together. And so a labor union creates market power for workers. And so it's kind of like having a monopoly in the labor market on the supply side. Collective bargaining is just what we call it when there's negotiations between unions and a firm or firms. It's when workers are bargaining collectively together. And there's another great table in the textbook, Table 14.6, looks at some of the largest American unions in 2015, the National Education Association, the American Federation of Teachers, International Brotherhood of Teamsters, you've probably heard of some of these, United Steelworkers, United Food and Commercial Workers, and uh, International Union, um, the International Associ uh, International Union, United Automobile, Aerospace, Agriculture, Implement Workers of America, Whew. and Service Employers International Union. And so all of these unions charge union dues and have elected leadership and then negotiate collectively. And the idea is that if you're the National Education Association and you have 2.9 teachers on your side, they're going to have more power than just one teacher asking for changes. Make sense? That's why we see teacher strikes, right? Um, if we look at this over this graph here, what we can see in this graph is the percentage or the share of wage and salary workers who belong to unions. So basically how many workers out there who are making either a wage or salary. And we can see that union membership really started to rise in the late 30s and early 40s and peaked in the 50s and 60s and then has been trailing off um, in the last 30 years. Um, what this book doesn't talk about is that we have seen new pushes towards unionization in the post-pandemic era, in the early 2020 decade, um, and we're still kind of waiting to see how that plays out. And um, if you ask, I could go in and look up some new data on that, but we have seen um, in recent news about workers at Starbucks and Amazon warehouses trying to unionize that there's been a little bit of a shift in the attitude towards union workers uh, and union membership. So what does it mean to work in a union? The idea here is that collective bargaining is going to raise wages. And most economists assume that without a union, wages would be at equilibrium. And so we'd be at some equilibrium wage and some equilibrium quantity of work or labors, uh, labor. A union will use its collective bargaining power to raise wages up to a wage, a union wage level. And that's going to result in an excess of labor. So real quick, let me show you what that would look like. If we look at a labor market where we have wages on the y-axis and the quantity of labor on the x-axis, 
And we start out with some assumption of an equilibrium demand for labor. Oop, not quite. And supply of labor. Um, we would assume that our equilibrium quantity would be here. We'll call it QE like the book does. And our equilibrium wage here would be here. We'll call it WE. Um, if the union negotiates for higher wages, what that means is they're going to say, hey, listen, we have fought for some higher wage. And that's going to be the union wage that's negotiated through collective bargaining, otherwise known as WU. The problem is, at this higher wage, workers are more willing to supply their labor, so the quantity supplied is going to be high, and firms do not want to hire as many workers because it's gotten more expensive. And so the quantity demanded is going to be lower. So what we'll end up with is what's called excess supply of workers. Right? Oops. Sorry, that's weird. Excess supply. Right? Supply exceeds demand. This is also called unemployment. When there are more workers supplying their labor to the market than jobs for them, that's unemployment. And so one of the reasons that economists don't love unions is that it leads to unemployment. Okay? So a union uses its bargaining power to raise wages up to the union wage, and that's going to result in an excess supply of labor in unions and a reduced demand for labor from union workers. What does that mean? Well, it means that either unions will um, have more higher rates of unemployment. It means that firms will be incentivized to hire non-union workers. Um, it might mean that... Um, Union workers, maybe they're more productive. If union workers are more productive, then they could rationalize those higher wages. Um, so there's a couple of different ways we could look at the outcome. The next thing we want to talk about is this idea of the National Labor Management Relations Act. And what this is, is a piece of law around labor markets that specified that workers have the right to organize a union and that management has to give them a fair chance to do so. And so you might hear some talk about this as we've seen an increase in the number of workers fighting for a union over time in the last few years. But basically where this came from is in the 1930s, um, there were a lot of unions forming and firms didn't like it. So they would do what's called union busting, where they would try to they would fire people for trying to organize a union or try to discourage workers from organizing a union. So in 1935, the National Labor Management Relations Act was passed and basically said, hey, listen, workers have the right to organize and firms, employers, managers can't punish them for doing so. It prevents uh, workers from being punished by firms and it allows workers to organize openly um, and have union elections. Um, and we see lots of unions around the world in terms of countries with lots of union coverage. Austria, France have more than 90% of wages determined by union bargaining. Um, the United States, only 12.5% of wages is determined by union bargaining. Spain, it's a little over 80%. Netherlands, 82%. Uh, United Kingdom, 35%, Sweden, 92%. Um, and so it really, there's a lot of variation in um, the presence of unions around the world. But the big idea is here that a union is going to give workers more market power to negotiate wages, resulting in higher wages, but also potentially excess labor supply. Cool? Cool. Um, like I said, we've seen a decline in the proportion of U.S. workers belonging to unions since the 50s. Uh, there's lots of reasons we could talk about this. Um, we've seen a decrease in manufacturing and jobs, and manufacturing used to have really strong unions. We've also seen some deregulation in industries like trucking that has turned it away from unions and turned for uh, allowed firms to hire non-union workers. We've seen a lot of globalization, increasing competition, and making union labor expensive, union labor less expensive. 
less attractive. Um, some workers are less likely to favor being in a union. Um, and the U.S. legal environment makes it a little bit more difficult for unions to organize and expand their membership. Um, and we're seeing that happen now, right? Lots of firms in the 20, early 2020s are trying to or not firms, workers are trying to organize labor unions, and there's a lot of challenges to it. And so it's getting a, to be a really complicated landscape. Um, and if you don't believe me, take a look at this chart. Look at how much we have seen a decrease in, oh, this chart is poorly designed. Hold on, let's fix that. Okay, sorry about that. Hopefully that's a little bit better. So here we can see the growth in service jobs over time. U.S. Um, membership to unions has declined over time, but jobs, jobs in the, jobs, jobs in non-governmental services have increased dramatically since the 50s, even including a little dip in uh, the early 2000s in the Great Recession. Um, we've seen outside of government employees, unions have not had a lot of success. We do see union membership in government agencies and in teaching and a couple couple of other job sectors, but not much elsewhere. Um, so uh, we'll see what the future of union membership will be like in the United States. But in summary, the U.S. Um, has had lower union membership than a lot of other high income countries. And um, that could be because of legal environments. It could be because of cultural attitudes. And it could just be changing. And we'll see what happens next. So now we've talked about market power on one side, market power on the other. Let's talk about a bilateral monopoly. So if we have monopsony power, monopsony power on the demand side of labor markets and union power on the supply side, that would be a bilateral monopoly where there's two monopolies on either side. And so that's going to alter our equilibrium. We're going to have the same two things that we've talked about before. So now we have Union wages, right, given by, let's clean this up a little bit, given by that union negotiating power. So let's put that here. And we're going to have the hiring based not on the labor market supply, but on the marginal cost of labor supply or the marginal cost of hiring labor. And so then what we're going to see is we're going to have an L star, which should be lower than the competitive labor market. And the wage effect is going to depend. So I happen to draw it just right here. But you can imagine a world where the marginal cost is here or here. And so what we know for sure is we're going to see the quantity of labor be lower than the equilibrium. And probably the unions are going to drive wages up, but that monopsony power is also going to put a little bit of downward pressure on wages too. And so it's going to be indeterminate. Um, but it's going to be somewhere in between the union wage and the monopsony wage because they're going to be using their negotiating powers against each other. So that's what we would expect in a bilateral monopoly. It's two forces pushing against each other and both driving down the equilibrium quantity of employment. So what else can we talk about in terms of labor markets? We can talk about employment discrimination. And what we want to look at here is earning gaps based on race and gender, the impact of discrimination on the competitive market, and some U.S. policies to try and combat and reduce discrimination. And it's useful here to mention that labor market discrimination can be along any range of dimensions of marginalization. And so we have discrimination based on race, gender, sex, religion, um, accent, um, level of ability, all different dimensions. We're going to talk about the most obvious ones. A lot of the data focuses on race and sex, and so um, that's what a lot of the economic research looks at. But you can imagine employment discrimination based on gender identity, sexual identity, a lot of different dimensions. Um, but basically, discrimination is just um, acting on the belief that members of a certain group, a certain demographic group, are inferior because of some factor. Um, and so therefore deserving of lower wages. And we can look at the data and we see pretty interesting evidence. One thing we can say is that the disparities have in general been improving a little bit. If we compare the ratio of black wages to white wages, in the 70s, they were in about 70% black 
wages to white wages. We see a peak in the disparities between black workers and white workers wages in the late 90s with it peaking up closer to 82%. But now we're getting back down in the early 2000s to a little bit lower disparities. The ratio of wages for female to male workers, on the other hand, is really altered to where we're getting a lot closer to wage parity or wage equity. In both cases, the gap remains. And if we look at this in more detail, like if we look at black women compared to white women, compared to white men, compared to black men, compared to black and Hispanic or Hispanic and Latino men and women, um, we'll still see lots of gaps persisting in different ways. But generally, some gaps have been shrinking. And so that's a little bit of good news. Um, the black white wage gap has not changed a lot, especially for, um, especially in, in labor markets. So what does that tell us? There's a couple of different things we can look at. Um, one thing we can see is if we look at male versus female earnings, the sort of female wage gap, the idea that women make less than men, um, changes in education policy have reduced that. So women have been acquiring higher rates of education um, over time, and that's helped to really reduce that wage gap. Um, there are concerns about where women have gotten to in terms of the level of employment, right, getting to high level positions, things like CEO, Congress, etc. cetera. Um, Women are still likely to bear a disproportionately large share of household responsibility and child rearing, what we call uncompensated labor, right? Doing free household work or unpaid household labor. Um, and so that's going to help erode those wages as they aren't able to do other things outside for work. Um, and some people believe that this issue is rooted in our social patterns of discrimination about the roles that women and men play in the sort of typical nuclear household of, oh, well, it's not a woman's job to make money, but it is a man's job to make money. And this perception that men and women um, marry each other and have kids and have these different roles. Um, and so there is there is still a lot of questions about whether or not that's playing a role in hiring decisions and in who gets promotions, who gets higher wages, those kinds of things. Um, if we look at uh, the black-white earnings gap and racial wage gaps, um, we see there was a lot of legal discrimination before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that's one of those pieces of labor market legislation that we talked about at the beginning of the book, um, at the beginning of the chapter. Um, there was definitely a lot of disparities in education for many years in the United States, for hundreds of years, and in the post-Reconstruction era and the post-Civil Rights era, and a lot of educational disparities still persist. We have seen the educational opportunities, the disparities in education decrease a little bit, but the racial earnings gap seems to be perpetuated in spite of changes in some education, we're still seeing big differences in levels of higher education, and we're still seeing what looks like evidence of labor market discrimination. So just over discrimination in labor markets. There's evidence to support labor, uh, there's also evidence to support discrimination in other markets that can affect labor markets. So housing market discrimination, let, uh, redlining, and um, disparate treatment um, in terms of things like um, zoning in black and white neighborhoods can lead to differences in home value, which then leads to differences in education quality and educational attainment. And then that is perpetuated through employment discrimination. Um, and so when we talk about the black white earnings gap or racial earnings gap and um, racial earnings disparities, there is a lot to sort of be disentangled there, and there's still a lot of work to be done. And the book has a table, table 14.9, looks at educational attainment by race and ethnicity in 2015. And this kind of data is all freely available at the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, and there's a lot of research being done these days on this subject. Um, but what we know for sure is that the disparities are persisting. Um, one of the biggest steps that the textbook makes is that we need to do something about the public policies. We need to make a larger choice 
um, uh, make a larger policy choice to try and reduce these disparities. And part of that could be removing or reducing educational disparities, especially at the public school level, so that students have equal access to elementary and secondary education. Improving those school performance is going to help um, give workers the same level of educational skill and ability before they enter the labor market. And then another policy that can help reduce wage gaps is what's known as affirmative action. And affirmative action is just a set of policies designed to reduce disparities. It's basically the name of efforts by government or businesses to give special rights to historically um, historically marginalized people or minorities in hiring, promotion, access to education, um, and other benefits in order to make up for past discrimination. And the idea is, is if you've been subject to historical disparities in wealth, education, housing, um, earnings, etc., it's going to set you back um, at sort of a a lower starting line than people who haven't been historically discriminated against. And so through affirmative action programs, we can even the playing field and give people equal access to employment opportunities of very many kinds. Um, and so there is a lot that can be done from the policy perspective, but there's always a question in economics of opportunity cost, and if we're being realistic of the political viability of these things. Um, what is exciting is that we do see a lot of changes in America's racial and ethnic diversity. The United States is becoming increasingly racial and ethnically diverse. And so one of the things that the evidence has shown us is that that's gonna help to reduce racial disparities and um, ethnic disparities by reducing levels of bias. And that might help break down some discriminatory barriers. Um, and then also increases in anti-discrimination policies and universal policies like giving access to universal programs that help support education, support development. Um, those are going to help to reduce those disparities too. Cool? Let me know if you have more questions about this. This is an area where I do a lot of research and so I'm always happy to talk about it more. Okay, last section we want to talk about is immigration. Immigration can affect the labor supply because what immigration is going to do is it's going to alter the quantity of workers and the kind of workers we have in our labor market. At different times, we've had policies that um, favor low education, low skilled workers, high education, high skilled workers, workers from different regions, workers who have family already in the United States. Um, we saw a sharp decline in the immigration and the number of immigrants accepted into the United States in the 1930s and 1940s, but we saw an increase in immigration in the early 2000s, which has helped fuel a lot of our economic growth. The economic effects of immigration, there's a couple of different things we can think of. One thing is immigration, if it is weighted towards low-skilled workers, it's going to tend to reduce wages for domestic low-skilled workers because it's going to make it more competitive at that end of the labor supply. So if there's more workers coming in with my skill level, I'm going to face more competition and lower wages. Um, there can be impacts on state and local government budgets. Again, it's going to depend on what happens with the workers in terms of their demand for public services versus their the tax revenue they generate. Immigration is going to tend to benefit the economy. It's going to increase demand for local goods and services, stimulating the labor market, stimulating the market economy at a local level. It's going to generally have a positive effect on taxes and government revenue at the state level. And when we have higher skilled immigrant workers, um, higher skilled immigration is going to tend to increase our technological advancement and human capital attainment. It's going to increase our numbers of intellectual property, um, increase our um, entrepreneurship. We're going to see higher wages, more tax revenue. And most economists believe generally that immigration is a net benefit. Some low-skill immigration is going to tend to hurt low-skill workers, but overall, the benefits to the economy are going to tend to exceed the costs. And so a good portion of economists believe in reducing barriers to immigration because economists like to generally have fewer barriers in general, right? More access, fewer borders. So that's our chapter on labor markets and income. Let me know what questions you have. Let me know what you'd like to spend more time talking about. If there's something you'd like to see a supplemental video about, um, 
keep an eye out for a short video just talking about how you determine that value marginal product of labor and giving you a little bit of a mathematical example of how that would work. Um, and let me know what you think, what questions you have, and I will see you next time. Take care.